our, first, our panel one is an all-star panel of people who know the ins and outs of uh, this topic better than anybody in California. I hope you all appreciate this in, in the audience. You can look at the biographies in particular. <clears throat> but um, we're going to do it in this order. We're, we're going to begin with Leslie Appleton Young, who's the Vice President and Chief Economist for the California Association of Realtors. Her job is, is to track the market trends, to see what's selling, what's not selling, and how many buyers are out there who are, who are being dissatisfied. Uh, we'll then follow that um, with Randall Lewis, who is Executive Vice President and Principal of Lewis Operating Group, which basically he's a home builder who builds communities, whole communities. And Randall Lewis has, had, has uh, um, been watching carefully the California market for many years and can tell us really what do the consumers want and how can the builders supply it better than anybody else, I think, can, can say. Then following that, uh, next we'll, we'll go to, to Glenn. Glenn Campora, who is the Assistant Deputy Director of the California Department of Housing and Community De Development. And uh, Glenn is in charge of the housing element process, or the housing needs process, the RENA process, trying to figure out statewide how do we know how many houses we need and how do we allocate that, that a fair share of housing needs to different communities. Uh, and that's a politically hot seat to be in because people oftentimes don't want to have any housing, even though we all need it together. And then we'll, we'll, we'll then close the panel with, um, with uh, Stephen Levy, who is uh, well known to all of you, I think, as he's been advising SCAG for many years. He's the director of the Center for Continuing Study of the California Economy. And Steve is unique in, in, in linking together the employment growth uh, and also the housing growth needs of the, of the state and of the region and, and communities. So we have a, gr a great set of speakers here. And then we'll try to have some dialogue at the end of the panel. But I'm going to let them each have an individual say here at the podium because they have so much to contribute. So first, I'll invite up Leslie Appleton Young. Thank you. Good morning. Is everybody awake? For any students in the room, I just want to say that enjoy every moment of your life because I'm looking at Dal, remembering him as a young post, Dal, I'm talking about you, a young <laughs> postgraduate student just moving out to Southern California and starting his job at USC, and it seems like only yesterday. So anyway, he asked me to come. Um, by this morning and just set the stage uh, with a little bit of information about the market and some of the research that we've been doing on millennials. The research that we do at uh, CAR, and I've got Carmen Hersiag from our research team um, who is our uh, survey lead, uh, is we spend a lot of time talking to uh, buyers and sellers, consumers, uh, to kind of find out what's happening so we can give our members kind of a, uh, a bit of a heads up. So um, that kind of is, is our direction. In addition, we receive um, uh, monthly data dumps from all of the MLSs, except one or two in the state of California. And that's the data that we slice and dice for the um, uh, aggregate kind of information that you see. So I just want to make a couple of points about the uh, housing market, and I'm going to be sp uh, speaking specifically about existing single family home sales. And a, a couple of points I want to make is uh, perhaps the key one is the housing market's doing okay, but not great. We really haven't had a um, noticeable surge since, um, you know, 2008, 2009, when we had. Um, in many, in some parts of California, we had homes priced below replacement costs. You had um, a, a 60 percent drop in the median home price in three years. So, you know, we called it the once in a generation opportunity to become a homeowner uh, in California. Housing affordability peaked in the first quarter of 2012, and that window has not only closed but pretty much slammed shut for many, uh, many of our um, of our residents. If I were coming back from a trip to Mars and you told me what 
household formation was currently and what mortgage rates were currently and what job and income growth in California were currently, I would think that home sales would probably be about 20% higher than they are. And they're not for some of the reasons we're going to talk about this morning. This is the recovery in housing prices. Many uh, communities are above their prior peaks. Uh, those are in uh, predominantly the Bay Area. The median home price right now in San Francisco is about 1.33 million. Um, many parts of Southern California have also recovered. Uh, the Central Valley is still lagging their, um, their prior peaks. We had um, double digit price appreciation until uh, that peaked in the summer, uh, spring summer of 2013, when the taper tantrum um, uh, created a, a significant increase in rates at that time. I think it was two months we had mortgage rates go up about a full percentage point. But since then, uh, we haven't had much movement in rates except in the generally in the downward. Um, downward direction. Uh, the other thing that has happened is that the price appreciation has really rescued a lot of current homeowners. So at the end of 2009, and this is the data from CoreLogic, 35% of the mortgages in California were underwater, and today that number is less than 8%. So that has really helped kind of the bottom line of households, not just in California, but around the country. So really, one of the big themes of what's happening in the market, and it has a variety of aspects, is the fact that inventory is low. And you've heard that, it's everybody's talking about it. Um, until a few years ago, the long run average for uh, unsold inventory in California was a six to seven month supply. So when the press would ask me how's inventory, I would say, well, the long, you know, I don't want to say it's a buyer's or seller's market, but I do want to say the data show that um, over the long term, six to seven month supply is normal. But if you look at the ba uh, past three to four years, it's more like a three to four month supply. And I'm beginning to think that that. Um, not only is the current reality, but that is the new normal for California for many years to come, given the sluggishness of the supply increases for new construction and given the lack of velocity or turnover uh, in the existing market. And this is, I think, really key. Even though this um, uh, workshop today is focused on millennials, uh, with respect to home ownership and housing, what the boomers are doing is really important, and Dal kind of alluded to this. They're not moving. It's not penciling out for the boomers. And I first started to look into this a couple of years ago when there was an article from the Washington Post about an, um, a boomer family that were empty nesters, and they wanted to sell their center hall colonial in Bethesda and kind of move downtown where it was trendy, and they thought, you know, probably get like a 1,600 square foot condo and put a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank and we'll be set for life. And what they found out was that was impossible, that the price appreciation in the trendy place where they wanted to go was so high that they were going to have to live in about 900 square, uh, square feet. And so they just decided to stay put. So it's a housing affordability problem that's not, you know, usually talk about people trying to enter the market. I think with these boomers, they're finding that even if they want to move, and some of them don't, right? They're aging, they're not aging, they're going to work longer, they're, they, they're going to be probate, you know, they really want to stay where they are. But for, um, for many of them, they want to do something, but they have a great mortgage, they have low property taxes, and Dal has written so many wonderful things about um, helping people understand Prop 13 then and now and kind of the unintended consequences um, of Prop 13. Um, the capital gains um, exclusion for a married couple is 500000 um, People uh, in parts of Los Angeles, uh, in the Bay Area, find that their gain at the current uh, current prices is well in excess of that, so that's keeping them uh, in, their, uh, in their homes. Some of them, great credit score, pay on their mortgage. It would be difficult for them to get a mortgage today. It's getting a lot 
easier, but you pay a higher premium for kind of being out of that um, box. And then everybody knows there's nowhere to go, right? There's nowhere to go. So it's a little bit of a vicious, um, vicious cycle. Um, here's some data just looking at turnover rates uh, uh, of the housing stock in California. So in the um, mid to late 70s, you had, you know, eight, nine percent of the stock turning over on an annual basis. And today in California, it's 4.2 percent, uh, 4.8 percent for the nation um, as a whole. And then this is survey data. We have done a a survey at CAR for 38 years, believe it or not, where we ask realtors about their last closed transaction. So these are properties that sold, and we're asking them how long had the seller been in their home prior to this sale. And um, the 2016 surveys in the field, so this is data from a year ago, 10 years is the highest number we've gotten in 38 years. Right, so that's just kind of another way of, of looking at that. Uh, we, we've calculated for many years a housing affordability index that answers the question, what percentage of households could afford to buy the median priced home given prevailing interest rates and 20% uh, down payment. We also do a first time home buyer. A survey. There are many different methodologies to measure housing affordability. I think they all tell the same story, which is it's getting a lot worse, um, and it's gotten dramatically um, uh, difficult for people um, entering the market. This is a look at housing affordability in counties throughout California. Uh, U.S. affordability in the first quarter of this year was 60 percent. It was half that in California. The Bay Area uh, um, down here in, Cal in San Francisco, it's 13 percent. San Mateo, it's 16 percent. Um, here's Los Angeles at about 28, hopefully. I don't have my glasses on, um, 28 percent. But you can see compared to the nation as a whole, we are at a, I don't know if you want to call it like the sunshine tax or the California premium, uh, whatever you want to call it, it's getting bigger. <laughs> it's getting bigger. Um, we also ask in this survey of realtors uh, on their last closed transaction, was your buyer a first time home buyer? And for the last three years, it's been less than 30% over the long term first-time buyers have been about 38% um, of the market, so we're well below, again, what you would think it would be if you didn't kind of look at all of the information, just looked at uh, rates and income and, um, and job growth. And then one of the questions we asked the realtors if their client had moved to a different county, we asked what was the main driver for that move between counties, and in one year, the number, the share answering housing affordability went from 14% to 23%. So this is getting measurably um, more difficult. And I didn't bring migration data. I'm probably someone else on the panel will be talking about that. Um, the migration data follows the housing affordability story, right? So when you look at the Bay Area, you see um, San Mateo and San Francisco moving to Alameda and Contra Costa, Alameda and Contra Costa moving to Solano and Sonoma. And obviously down here in, in Southern California, we've had the ebb and flow with the Inland Empire for uh, quite some time, and that is uh, ongoing. So just a couple of things about boomers. This is the slide my staff gave me. This is a slide that I wanted because, you know, you're always who you were when you were 20, right? Um, but just, um, I don't have my slides in front of me, but a, a large proportion of Californians over 55 haven't moved since 1999. What number is that? 71%, okay. And then on this one, what's the number? Almost half have been in their homes for at least 25 years. So that, again, is another way of looking at that turnover data I showed you earlier. So the boomers that answered our survey, their average age was 59. 56% uh, were married. 20, help me out, 26% were single. Uh, the rest were having more fun than the other two groups, I'm sure. <laughs> 75% identified themselves as homeowners, 
and 92% of them said they had equity in their home, right? So that ties in with that core logic data that we saw earlier. And this is really interesting. 59% said no, absolutely not. They are not moving when they retire. In fact, only 10% said yes, I am planning to move when I retire. And I wish we had been doing this survey for the last 30 years because it'd be interesting to see what those numbers were back then. But there was a time when leisure world was an attractive option, right, in terms of lifestyle and so on. Today, leisure world is an attractive option because it's affordable housing, right? It's affordable housing. Um, over half of them are worried about the ability of their children to become homeowners, and 43% of that group is willing to help their kids with the down payment. And this is really a critical kind of intergenerational transfer that's happening more and more for the boomers that can afford, um, can afford to do that. And then this was my boomer, what keeps you up at night? And I thought it was interesting because you had a very large, I call that my ambient control group, right? That's the 39% that said nothing. And I, I just don't know what that would be like if it wasn't involving a drug of some kind, you know? So um, anyway, so we also surveyed millennials. I'd like to thank them all for redefining Maslow's hierarchy. And I, I noted that Dal did have the Wi-Fi code on the title page when we, uh, when we got here. So this is from 2014, and we were uh, inspired to do this survey because of all of this. Millennials are mobile, they don't want to own homes, and that is completely not true. You essentially had a generation that delayed adulthood by eight years eight to 10 years because they graduated and there were no jobs and they are being parented by the most codependent parents in history who were only too happy to have them move back home, take care of them, do their laundry, talk about apps and music and keep it going. And now that's kind of changing, right? Everybody's ready to move on, but that really kept them, I mean, that's um, a very large percentage of, were saying that they, they stayed at home. Only 20% were owners and 40, whatever that is. Um, and then we asked them their attitude towards the home buying process. 50% said positive, 50% said negative. So that was kind of a heads up to our industry about making the process a little bit a little bit more fun. But this is something I think, um, this question was, could you obtain a mortgage right now? And 45% of them said they didn't know. And we think home ownership is so important for long-term long-term wealth building that financial literacy ought to be at the top of the list for um, for us and, and we're you know going back in and doing uh, getting involved in some more programs because you ought to have kids graduating with a knowledge of how they're going to make um, make these things um, happen so I just have a couple of slides unfortunately I, I can't see my slides very um, very well I don't know can I go I don't know what to do. I can't see them, and I don't have them in front of me. So let me just see. OK, this is, um, do you think you could afford to purchase in your current um, in your current neighborhood. So this is a survey that we just finished and we haven't even completed the report yet. We talked to over 3,000 Californians, so it was a very big sample. So we've been able to dig uh, demographically as well as um, um, owners versus uh, renters. So I just will kind of go through these quickly. We also do a breakout by ethnicity. I think it's very important to overlay home ownership and housing issues with ethnicity and income inequality issues. That tells you a lot um, about what's going on. If you haven't read Raphael Bostic's article that he published a couple of months ago, I think it was uh, Black History Month, that it, it really um, it really tells you um, um, a lot. So many of them can't afford to buy um, where they are. This is um, uh, 
attitudes toward housing. So just in general, I will say that you're absolutely right. We, we need a lot more education. And, you know, maybe I'll just stop now because I'm, 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 I'm kind of out of time. But let me just say that we will be releasing um, this study. I think there was a tremendous amount of really great information about attitudes towards housing, what kind of housing they're looking for, what kind of trade-offs um, they, they want to make. And then finally, just a lack of education. They don't know about FHA. They don't know about low down payment uh, programs. They don't know about what's available out there uh, for them. So um, we can, any way we can partner and provide uh, data on all of this, we're really happy to do so. I'm sorry I went over. I'm a little whatever. Okay, thank you. How can you get a copy when it's released? You can email me, Leslie A at car.org. You can go to our website, car.org. And Carmen, how soon will we have that report done? Do you think? Is it another month? Yeah, I would say by the end of July we will have that available. I will send it to you, Dal, um, and uh, the data will be available. It, it's it's really a great um, a great resource. So thank you. What a resource. That's, that's, that's huge. I can't wait to get my hands on it and study all that. <laughs> but um, our next speaker is going to be Randall, Randall Lewis, who, uh, how long is your report? <laughs> well, it'll all average out. It'll right? average out. <laughs> Thank you, Dell. Leslie, that was fantastic. What a great speaker you are. I'd like to thank USC and SCAG for doing this. I mean, our whole lives are determined by demographics and how we do policy, how we make our planning. So it's great we're having this study. My name is Randall Lewis. I first want to let you know who I am and the perspective I'm coming from. So we do a lot of work in the Inland Empire in real estate. We're a developer of master plan communities. We have land for almost 30,000 houses. We like buying land. And we sell about 1,000 or 2,000 lots a year to home builders. We also own about 9,000 apartments. Two-thirds of them are in the Inland Empire. And we build 500 to 1,000 apartments a year, and we do shopping centers. So this stuff is vital to me. I mean, we live this stuff every day. So what I wanted to do is just talk about some of the, the big ideas I took away about the millennials and the housing, and then talk about how I apply it as our, what our company tries to do. Then talk about a couple things for the demographers in the room, just some things to be cautious about. And then most important, I'll close with what it might mean for the policymakers in the room, the electeds, the planning directors, et cetera. So I think first point, it's a huge market. However, Dow wants to define it if it's 70 million, 80 million, 85 million. It's a huge market that is not one market. It's a market made up of scores of different markets, and you really have to understand that. Likewise, when you're looking at it, it's not just demographics. I mean, it's more than just how old are you, what year were you born, and what month. I was going to title this, Washa Lou is not Cheryl Vegas Walker. I don't think Walk Wash is here. But if you take their demographics, they were born within four months of each other. They are almost indistinguishable demographically. And yet anyone who knows them knows Washa Lou is not Cheryl Vegas Walker. So if you're trying to think of your studies, don't think about these macro things with 80 million people. Think about a group of individuals in your market. It's really, really important. It's stuff like lifestyle. It's stuff like life stages, the things that Dal talked about that really mattered. Dal talked about the life cycle and the life stages. I heard this last week at Playa Vista. Someone was talking about one typical life stage. And that was, she said, a girl moves into an apartment. She gets a pet, probably a dog. She gets a boyfriend. They get married. They have a kid. They go by. But they may do that at 25. They may do that at 35. They may never do it. But these life stages and life cycles are really important to try and to understand where people are. And it doesn't necessarily just get tied to their age. We're seeing that home ownership rates are dropping. We're seeing that birth rates are dropping. And that's something that's really impacting our work. And I think it's a lot of the stuff that demographers are going to be hearing today. 
We're also seeing that car ownership rates seem to be dropping, and certainly car driving rates I know are driving. We hear more and more from the consumers in the literature, a car isn't as important. It's still really important, but it's not as important to so many people. We're seeing in terms of pets that in almost every one of our communities, we have more pets than kids, which has some implications for how you design the park system. We're seeing this thing about people living at home, and the number that's generally thrown out is about a third of the millennials are living at home. I don't know what it is in each of your markets, but it's a pretty good number. But that's a huge untapped market, most of which are there because they're forced to live at home with their parents, as cool as it is, as coddling as the parents are. These people would escape if they could get out, and they, they want to get out. There's a lot of discussion on where the millennials want to live, and Dal talked about that. Do they all want to live in the city? And what we've seen people fall into three main categories. One is how many want to live in the city. ULI did a big study and said 37% want to live in the big city. They did a study that said something like 35, 36% want to live in the suburbs, and probably 24, 25% want to live away from the suburbs, want to live away from the big city. Again, I don't know what it is in your submarkets, but think about that. Not everyone wants to live in the big city, but a lot do, just like a lot want to live in the suburbs. We see that the affordability matters are just key, whether it's the student debt that was mentioned before or just can't get a job. Affordability is key, and we have to think how to make housing affordable. And then there's a perception that the, all of them have just delayed decisions. They're all going to turn into their parents eight or ten years later in the cycle. I think that's true for a significant number of millennials, but I don't think it's true for all the millennials. Not all of them are going to be turning into their parents. And so you need to think in your specific city or your specific area, not all of them are going to turn into their parents. So what does this mean for me as a practitioner? Well, first it means we really study this stuff hard. I spend a lot of time on demographics, a lot more time on consumer research. We spend so much time now talking to different consumers to try to understand them. And then we're trying to think how to use the data in our markets, how to come up with some predictive analysis that says if we know people do certain things at different ages, life stages, when they get raises, whatever, how can that help us plan future products. So we're really trying to look at the predictive side of the data analysis to see what could it tell us over the next few years. We're really finding from our study, the millennials, that the sense of place matters more and more. Dell talked about that. Are we moving into a European lifestyle? I'm, I'm not sure it's exactly that, but it's pretty close to what Dell talked about. So sense of place as you're trying to create the communities is really important, and we're looking a lot at that. We're really trying to figure out the mobility issue. We know that some of them are driving less. We know Lyft, Uber's already here. We know autonomous cars are coming. And we're trying to think, how do we bridge the gap? We think we're going to be in a dramatically different world 10 years from now. How do we plan for that now, knowing that our parking needs are going to change, the garage needs are going to change? How do we get from here to there in a changing world of mobility? And then finally, as a company, we're building a whole lot more apartments than we ever dreamed of. For all the reasons you've heard about, there's a gigantic demand for it, and we're trying to fulfill that in the private sector. So now, what does this stuff mean for the demographers? Just a, a few points to be careful on. Number one, be really careful on the density calculations you're talking about and the kinds of housing. A lot of times, people mix up higher density with rentals. And yet in the city of Chino now, we are building detached houses for sale at 17 per acre and duplexes for rent at 15 per acre. So the rentals are at lower density. So don't just assume that if something's higher density, it's a rental. Also really understand the difference between a townhome, a condominium, a rental or for sale. There's a lot of confusion in the research on that. Really dig into the ethnicity. That was such a great point that Leslie made. We're finding that there's significant demographic differences and preferences based on ethnicity. It could be something as simple as multi-generational living, which races with ethnicities favor having grandparents in the home, favor multi-generational living. We found that it's really impacting when first-born boys leave the house, when first-born or second-born girls leave the house. It's affecting floor plans. So dig really deep into these ethnic preferences. They're very, very powerful. 
Really try to look at this for sale versus for rent. It's very confusing now where people are actually living. There are major companies building rental communities or buying foreclosures. There are hundreds of thousands of houses being rented. And it's not only always clear who's living in, the, who's owning those houses. Are they on the ownership ranks or are they on the rental ranks? So be careful of that. And then also look at some of the new housing options for people. I have a son in New York, a USC and a Claremont graduate who's unemployed. He got kicked out of his apartment by his sister, said, you gotta go somewhere else. He's now an Airbnb refugee. He's just renting every night at different Airbnb places. That can distort the numbers too, where people are Airbnb refugees. And final note to the demographers, the industry, the housing industry has a lot of data. We'd love to figure out if you need it, how we can help you to use some of our data. And now for the elect is the people in the room are going to try to take all this stuff, the policymakers. What are you going to do with it all? Well, first, you know that housing's key. We're in the middle of a crisis. And whether it's for the economy, whether it's for moral reasons, whether it's for public health reasons, we have to deal with the housing issue. So try to take the data, the things you're learning today, and think how can you apply them. Number one would be to rethink all of your standards. It might be your parking standards. It might be the size of your floor plans. It might be the amount of open space that you've got. It might be the amount of land you need for dog parks because there's so many pets there. But really try to think of the standards because they are probably obsolete for what a lot of the millennials want. Really try to think if on the millennials, if you have a goal to keep your millennials in your community, Try to think of the price. What can you do to help with the price? Try to think about the supply. You're going to hear this from Steve, and you're probably going to hear it from Glenn. Supply is a powerful force to keep housing affordable. So try to think of the price, the supply. Try to think of the type of housing. Because of the things Leslie showed and Dowd show, it's hard to do the kind of housing millennial wants because a lot of the existing residents don't want it. But try to think what is the supply of the housing and then really spend time on this idea of placemaking. A lot of the millennials seem to place a greater importance on the placemaking itself. Stephen's gonna talk more, and Dal talked about this, and Leslie talked about this idea of the seniors. A lot of the seniors are staying put because they can't afford something new, but a lot of cases, because we as developers have not created the right alternatives for the seniors. To the extent that you can create those options, you will free up housing for the millennials. And the cheapest house to put a millennial in is the one that already exists without all the new fees and all the land cost. Stephen Levy's having a heart attack if you're going like this. So thank you, Stephen, for that feedback. I'm glad you like it. And then lastly, I just wanted to say education. There's been some really strong correlations between education, educational attainment, and the incomes. And if we want to keep the millennials in housing, they have to have the education so they can have the incomes to have the jobs to afford new rentals and to afford new housing. Really work with your school districts, work on education. It's directly linked to the housing issue. So then finally, I just want to wrap up and just say, I'm so glad to be here because this is a really key issue. We've got to figure out how to solve the housing crisis. And something Dal said that really struck with me, I think we have to personalize it for the people who are fighting houses. These aren't just nameless numbers. These are our children. These are your brothers. These are your sisters, your nieces and nephews. They have a right to good housing, and they deserve nothing less than housing in the communities where they want to live. Thank you. Wow, we're really getting it, aren't we? This has been the, that was from the private sector side, so perceptive. And now we go to the public sector side, also perceptive. Glenn Campora has come down from Sacramento. I'm so pleased that you're here to tell us what more can we do to meet all the needs of these developers and would-be home sellers who want to make the housing market hum? I'm here to pass the blame around to everybody. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. How do you work this? All right. So the most important part about this slide is the information at the very bottom. Uh, my crack staff, Megan Kirkaby, with her phone number, if she'll stand up. <clears throat> so 
So just to let you know, I'm doing my part. You know, she probably qualifies for a millennial, and I'm soon going to be, you know, unclogging, you know, the workforce and creating an opportunity for others to come up. So we'll start there. Now, Leslie, I understand your problem. I can't see the slide either, so. But I got my cheat sheet here. Okay, so it, it sort of kicks off with the, um, you know, the planning and the development process and the, you know, and for the uh, developer, I'm sure that they think it kicks off with the, um, you know, the demographics and the, uh, and the consumer and the market process. But real quick, you know, there's, uh, California Department of Housing, you know, works closely with regional council to governments, SCAG and so forth, and obviously local cities and counties to plan for housing. And so we do the very first part, the projected housing need, that's often referred to as ARENA. ARENA stands for Regional Housing Need Allocation, or essentially new units. So we get our information from demographers. So, so they play a key role in our, in our planning process. So demographers tell the California uh, Department of Housing uh, you know, what household formation ratios are you know, by age cohort and so forth. And that helps us determine housing need in different regions. And again, we're talking at State Department of Housing at the regional level. And then the regions then break down that regional housing need allocation arena. They distribute it or allocate it down to local governments, cities and counties. The local governments then, in fact, you know, have to meet that target or that planned, you know, housing unit figure by undergoing, um, you know, the planning process locally and, of course, then the zoning process. So they have to decide where in their locality they are going to zone for more residential development. And some of the big growth that's going on in zoning is mixed use. So mixing now, uh, you know, residential use with uh, retail and commercial and that sort of thing. And then it ultimately comes down to the developers looking at those local government housing element plans and determining where the zoning is, you know, for more housing to occur. And the developers applying for the building permit and dealing with local governments on getting the permit approval process. So I said dealing with local governments on the permitting process. That introduces something here that's not quite on this slide, but I'm sure you can all recognize that. And that is that on the permitting process, that's where local government, particularly the decision makers, you know, really have it tough. You know, they're face down with, you know, a lot of community opposition. You know, a lot of people know what NIMBYism is. It stands for not in my backyard. So residents, you know, as soon as they, residents blame developers and they go to these hearings and they want to say, you know, don't build anymore. And otherwise, we'll throw you out of office. I think one of the other speakers mentioned, you know, that it's a political hot potato. And so, yes, so there's a lot of community opposition. Well, who is that community opposition? Typically, you know, they are homeowners, uh, probably more likely than not, they are probably, um, you know, mature homeowners. And so, again, as you go through the life cycle stage, as I'm going through, you know, as you get older, you get forgetful, right? So you forget, you know, what it was like to be a millennial and need a house and you couldn't afford it and so forth. So these people are out there saying, you know, don't build anymore. We, we don't want you to change the fabric of our, of our community. So when I come to this sometimes in the local government process and because and, they like to blame the state because they have to do it, um, you know, we hear a lot of community opposition. And I say, look, you know, look at your schools. You know, they're, they're crowded with, you know, teens. They're, they're crowded with first graders and so forth. So it's all of us residents that are producing more children. They have to live somewhere, so we need to do our part. Typically, it doesn't help that much, but, you know. Um, going down to the building process. So let's pick on developers a little bit. Developers really have it tough, if you think about it. You know, everybody blames developers for, you know, you know, speculating and so forth. But developers have to be the interaction between the market, which is ever-changing, all right? They're squeezed between trying to get the land at a cost that can make the unit more developable. They're squeezed about, you know, dealing with local governments on how much density so they can get more units, again, to make homes more affordable. 
they're squeezed on the marketplace by the mix between what kind of unit is going to sell. Is it going to be a multifamily? Is it going to be a rental? Is it going to be a single family, square foot, and so forth? So again, they're taking the risk. So they're not getting too much help from the consumer market because the demand is always changing as far as housing type. They're not getting a lot of cooperation with the local government because the local you know, opposition as far as nimbyism. And they may not even be getting enough help on the planner side from the standpoint that where they are zoning may not be close to services, may not be close to jobs, and may not be close to mass transit or public transit. So like I said, the developers really do have it tough. You owe me on that one, Randall. <laughs> okay, uh, next, lead, next slide here. Well, you've already seen some of this, some of this information. So again, real quickly, um, the State Department and most of this slide presentation is, is for our forthcoming statewide housing plan. And we're required to put that out, you know, uh, I think statutorily about every four years. So we're only, you know, like 10 or 15 years behind. Our last statewide housing plan was produced, you know, in the late 90s, around 1998. And at that time, you know, due to some great work by demographers, uh, I think principally, you know, UCLA and so forth, they projected, you know, a you know, a 10-year or 20-year um, statewide housing need of 220,000 units per year. And again, this was just at the turn of the 2000s, okay? So you can see from that graphic that, uh, you know, we were under that, but we actually got pretty close to it in the, in the height of the building boom, 2004, 2005, et cetera. And now in the 2015-2025 statewide housing plan, which the California Department of Housing has, uh, is in draft and is about ready to release for public comment and so forth, um, State Department of Finance, uh, their cracked demographic unit, you know, has, you know, essentially helped us to project a annual housing need of 180,000 units, you know, until 2025. So it's less than what it was and it goes back to demographics, household formation, change in demand, consumer habits, and so forth. So again, all of us have it tough trying to figure out, you know, what is an adequate level of planning target, you know, to plan for housing, and how much of it, you know, can be built, and what types, and so forth. The good news about this slide, uh, which is sort of demonstrated a little bit from what Randall just said, is the last couple of years, there's been an increase in or higher proportion of multifamily rental housing versus single family. And uh, you'll hear a lot at this conference about some reasons about that. But of course, you know, the, the housing bubble um, and the credit, you know, uh, changes and even changes in perspectives. You know, again, the, uh, you know, the seniors perhaps, you know, want to looking to gather their larger single family homes and go into, you know, the townhouses and the condos and so forth and be closer nearby shopping and services. That might be one factor. Also persons that, you know, were homeowners that became renters and now have to, again, stay renters until their credit scores boost up or they can save enough of a down payment. So a lot of factors for that. Okay, am I stuck here? Oh, all right. <clears throat> this, uh, let's see, this demonstrates what we refer to as the, again, the regional housing need allocation cycle. So this is a State Department of Housing activity. And again, regionally, we push out that arena target to the um, Council of Governments like SCAG and so forth. This is the fourth cycle. It was based upon that, you know, again, some demographics, uh, from the Department of Finance and so forth, and it was related back to that 220,000 unit annual need. And so those were regional housing allocations. And those little um, parts about the pie, which you can probably see better in your, in your pamphlet than I can. So we had, you know, the, essentially the, the circles there are, is the dispersion of the regional housing needs in, in very large regions. We actually do it by county. And there is not just the Skag region. The large one on the bottom is, is essentially both Southern California and, and San Diego. All right, San Diego. But the point about it is, is that, you know, the size of those pies was the regional housing need allocation or planned housing from State Department of Housing. So we told local governments, you know, this is how much you have to plan for, right? 
So the local governments, you know, by state housing law, have to zone for that and accommodate that in their housing elements. So most of them did their part. And then you can see that um, among the large circles that was zoned, you know, capacity, we had shares that were essentially, you know, single family. We had shares that were market rate, and then we had shares that were essentially the green, which is, you know, um, the affordable units from California Tax Allocation Credit Committee, TCAC kinds of stuff. But we also have quite a bit of those circles that was not um, developed. So we had a lot of capacity, and because of the changes in the housing market, the recession, and so forth, you know, a um, an absence of production. So uh, I think Dow um, had some some better uh, statistics and graphics about this, but it's like again, when there's not enough supply, lack of production. All right, it causes some some pain, you know, among different households of different income categories. And so this, you know, sort of graphic sort of divides the households among their income categories, and, and there's five of them. <clears throat> And we see that, again, for those who, you know, are above moderate incomes, you know, they don't have too much of a problem. But you can see the gap really Im impacts the extremely low income households, you know, as far as finding, uh, you know, rent and number of units that they can afford, and also the very low income households. A little bit, ob obviously, for the moderate also. So those are huge impacts. And from the State Department of Housing and also my perspective, you know, the thing that we're always trying to grapple with is, is kind of where some of the questions that, uh, you know, that Dow had in his presentation is, where do they go? You know, and they can't be counted in the census. So if persons are, you know, had to leave their, their units because of the housing crisis and the, and the bubble, and they had to overcrowd, or they, had, or they were homeless, or, or whatever the search situations were, it's very difficult for that kind of information to get churned up in the census. And maybe it's because, you know, there's so much household turnover or persons like ourselves, you know, aren't answering the census data, you know, enough. But it's, it's hard to see if they're not in a housing unit, they've got to be someplace. And we don't necessarily see huge numbers of increases in homelessness, although it is rising. We also don't see uh, huge increases in overcrowding. Again, so it's, we rely upon the data, but when the data, you know, can't capture it, it makes it very difficult for planners, state, region, and local governments, and even builders to, uh, to respond. So in our, uh, in our business of giving out planning targets, and you'll hear me use those terms often, planning and targets. So we don't require that it be produced. So it's planning and targets. And the first thing local governments, you know, typically ask is, well, the state needs to, if they're going to demand through housing law that we have to go through this process of, of arena and zoning and all that, then there should be state resources. And, with, and there have been state resources. But again, like resources at every level, federal, state, and local, there has been, you know, some instability and some declines. And that has impacts primarily on affordable housing development. Typically, State Department of Housing funds are used to um, essentially partner with local monies, former redevelopment agencies. It probably didn't help uh, from a local government perspective that you know the state dissolved redevelopment, which had a 20% set aside for affordable housing and so forth. So that probably has some impacts. That didn't occur until 2010. Okay, so back to, you know, some, some pain for some households. And again, typically, as I said in two slides ago, it impacts the extremely low and the very low. Those generally are groups that can qualify for federal housing choice vouchers and Section 8 assistance. And again, because of a shortage of units, shortage of the right kinds of units, a shortage of units in the right locations, um, they're having very hard times with enough of a housing choice voucher to cover essentially the fair market rent. So those households 
they can still use their voucher, but they're having to pay more cash out of their pocket to afford that rental unit, which is increasing the overpayment of households. Some households are paying, you know, over 50% of their gross income for rents, and 50% is getting to be somewhat of a normalized figure for those that are overpaying, and in some cases it's as high as, you know, 60 and 65%. So you know what happens there. Of course, you know, there's more persons that are in the household because they need to increase household income. There's more workers that are working longer, and there's more workers that are holding down more jobs. Those have some other impacts, and this, this graphic is, is sort of to indicate where the projected household growth is, you know, sort of in the future, and to kind of show the picture of how it's in the valley, you know, and of course it's still, you know, heavily a lot of growth in the um, Southern California area, but also a lot of, um, you know, disadvantaged communities because of some of those other factors, you know, a lack of good paying jobs, and, you know, we've got a global economy now, and persons aren't getting out of the workforce, uh, businesses, business startups, you know, are, are it's very risky. So we have some, some disadvantaged communities, yet the growth is still occurring there to make those disadvantaged communities, you know, even more disadvantaged than they otherwise might be. And that's something that concerns, concerns us. And I think uh, Leslie had mentioned, you know, um, Professor Bossier's study, you know, who does a lot of work on disadvantaged communities. And so it's very tough from a planning perspective, you know, to try to get some equity in disadvantaged communities, yet plan for that growth to occur where we think it's going to again be close to services, jobs, and transit. Typically disadvantaged communities don't have as much abundance of those kinds of things. So again, it makes it, it, makes it very tough. And as I said before, it makes it very tough for the uh, developers to take that risk. You know, it used to be, you know, plan it, and they will build, build and they will come, and none of us know anything about that. And so now let's talk about the blame game. All because of the millennials, right? Because we don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, you know, science and art. I say science because you know, the demographers are good at counting, and the, the art is perhaps they might disagree on some of the assumptions that go along with those kind of things, so demographers can, can have some differences of you know which cohort is going to do what and so forth. They give us that information. So the blame game goes something like this: on the planning side, you know, um, local governments, you know, blame their regional council of governments for you know giving us giving them an outrageous housing unit target. Regional councils of governments blame the state department of housing for giving them an out, outrageous and uh, inflated housing unit target. And so who do we blame? Demographers, right? We blame the Department of Finance, you know, so the poor demographers. And who do they blame? The census, <laughs> because it's all good census data. Who do the census people blame? They blame the residents for not completing the data so they can't give us all better data, right? And so, again, all comes back down to what is it, you know, the residents themselves who aren't completing the census information, and they're out there in the audience saying, you know, don't grow us, don't grow us anymore, you know, and stop this development and so forth. And it comes back down to just, just all of us have a huge part of this, and we just forget to uh, play our roles. That's it for me. I'm happy to entertain a few quick questions. I think I may have gone over my time, so. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. And now we'll have Steve Levy come up and address the connections. I, I, you know, one more, uh, you know, demographers have one more out, you know, Glenn. We say if the employers would just stop creating all those jobs, it would all work out fine. But we want the jobs and we want the people. And we want the housing too, but we can't make it happen. But Steve, you can make it happen. Steve Levy, the voice of wisdom comes up. Is that your presentation? Good move. So, do I move the slides? Ooh. 
Well, we can move the slides. Wow. Leslie and Dowell talked to you a lot about how millennials are behaving, how they answer survey questions, how seniors are behaving, how they answer survey questions. But I would put to you that how they answer those questions depends on the world that they see. And so I'm really interested in what Randall asked twice. Can we change the world that they see so that their answers will change? Everybody thinks, and I've listened to everybody, that this is hopeless, housing costs too much, even if we could get the cost down, there are NIMBYs who will stop it. Seniors can't move because of taxes and they can't find any place to live. Millennials are trapped with their parents. I don't believe any of that. Okay. I don't believe any of that is permanent or necessary. And by the way, if you look in your packet, Glenn had probably his most important slide that he didn't have enough time to talk about but it's in the packet and I'll talk about it a little. So you can see that. Um, I have the slides, whether I can read the numbers or not. So we're talking Southern California. This is a little different version of what Dahl showed for renters, but the story is the same. Massive housing shortage that has clouded all of the answers that you've heard from Leslie and Dowell, because people do different things when there's not enough housing to find or it's not affordable. Um, the first bar is what we built. The second bar is what we would have built if we had just kept up with population growth and nothing else changed since 2007, so that's a pretty big shortage. But the third bar is what we would have built knowing that birth rates fell, knowing that millennials and boomers moving into senior status have very small households. So we would expect the household size to fall and the number of units needed to rise given all of those demographic factors. And that is a massive shortage. And it caused everything that you've heard about. It caused gentrification because people that had money bid up units that used to be affordable. I have to cheat because I, like you, the others can't see that. Um, it caused the living with parents. And it caused these enormous equity challenges and implications. The what comes next after displacement is that lower income households had to move and most likely they moved out to where it was cheaper. That in turn, that displacement and moving further away caused environmental issues. So the housing, sh housing shortage has economic implications, it has equity implications, and it has environmental implications. And one of the ways I think we need to overcome the resistance to housing is to get those groups to see themselves as connected and not working only in their equity, economic, or environmental silos. Um, on Glenn's slide that he didn't show you, he would have reminded you that for the people I work with, housing is the number one economic challenges for business groups in Southern California and in Northern California. We will lose our competitive edge if we don't have enough housing and enough transportation to connect people. You know it's an equity issue. Um, you know it's an environmental issue. So one chart and one phrase, just what I said. Um, we are all connected. Those communities 
It either works for the economy and equity and the environment. It either works for low-income households, middle-income households, and upper-income households, or it doesn't work. And the only way it works for all of those is if we dramatically increase housing. What Glenn didn't say is that his 180,000 units, I think I'm right, Glenn, deals with the growth that's projected, but it has some catch-up for the shortage. It doesn't, um, in Dowell's word, world, think that people are forever paralyzed in these very low home ownership rates and very low household formation rates living in parents that are the cause of the great housing recession and the jobs recession. It unfreezes them and builds units to catch up. Okay. Um, that would say a win-win approach. Good. Randall and I think Dahl talked about place, um, millennials in place. I talk about walkable communities. I think it's the same thing. Um, my little personal history, um, Leslie, is that we sold our house, we paid the capital gains, we ported our property tax over from our old house, we moved downtown, we put a lot of money in the bank, we never used the car. Our son, who is 32, and his wife, who is 29, and their baby, who is seven months and the joy of our life, live in a walkable community in Costa Mesa in a townhouse, so we may be untypical. We made the shifts um, in my community People like to live, um, I think it was Randall or Glenn that said, close to jobs, close to services, close to shopping. If we're all lucky, close to transit. That's a sense of place. It doesn't have to be in a city. I live in Palo Alto. I hear Pasadena has a great downtown. Now, Los Angeles downtown is growing again, but every suburb as a downtown that can be a walkable place for condos or townhouses or apartments. So this idea that cities and suburbs are really different is, is morphing, because at least where I live, every suburb has a little city downtown area where a lot of housing can go. Yeah, I can see the problem that everybody had. You can't see, you can't see the slides. Okay, I'm gonna talk a lot at the end if I have time about connections. But one connection has been mentioned and it's really, really, really important. Leslie said that a lot of seniors feel that they can't move for affordability reasons. I think Randall said, and I agree, that we can change that Remember the people who are 65 now or 70 and active, like my wife and I, in 10 years will be 80. And maybe living in that big single family home is no longer attractive, no matter what the cost features are. So if we build apartments or condos or townhouses in walkable areas for seniors so they don't have to worry about driving, that will free up existing single-family homes for millennials, for um, the group that's in between that I forgot the name between the boomers and the millennials. But providing housing for seniors, the ones that want to move, is a huge piece of opening up options for millennials and other groups. A lot of people think they get that the lack of supply led people with money to bid up prices and rents and displace people with less money. They get gentrification, but for some reason they don't think it works in reverse. I disagree. If we had built the 200 or the 300,000 more units here, you would have had less gentrification, less increase in rent. 
less increase in prices. Maybe they wouldn't go down. Supply really, really matters. If you don't think supply matters, uh, I guess the Dixie Chicks are the, are the ones that are famous now. They're going on tour. If 20,000 Dixie Chicks tickets got added to the pot, would the people selling their tickets on StubHub raise their price or lower their price? Tonight is the fifth and maybe final game in the NBA playoff. If 20,000 tickets became available for Oracle Arena, would the people selling their Warrior tickets on StubHub lower their price or raise their price? So if 200,000 more housing units became available in Southern California, why in the world wouldn't existing sellers and existing renters feel the downward pressure the same way that they felt the upward pressure when there were shortages? Supply really works. Supply in location works even better. Supply in location, listening to what Randall said and taking account of buyers works even better. Um, if you would looked again at the last of Glenn's slides, and it's in your packet, Randall mentioned a couple of things that could be done. We can change parking requirements. Um, we can explore new building materials. We can look at density requirements that force units to be too big. We can look at what are called secondary or granny units. We can reform CEQA. The governor now has a by right proposal to eliminate some of the regulatory impediments. There are lots of things that people can do to make it easier to build housing. Last piece is one chart, one phrase, one word. The impediment is not just NIMBYs, or the buy right proposal, or the buy right proposal is um, if your project has a certain amount of housing for low income residents or is in an area near transit or has some combination of the two, the governor has a proposal that's now in the budget process that would make approval by right if it met existing local city zoning ordinances. So it couldn't be a referendum, it couldn't be taken through the whole process. Um, connected. This is a conference about millennials, but you can't help millennials without helping seniors. You can't help all people who need more housing without helping people whose 24-7 passion is for low-income individuals, but they alone can't solve any problem if there isn't enough housing supply to fight gentrification. And none of this works really well if we're building housing in places that stretch the transportation infrastructure and increase greenhouse gas emissions because the two parts of SB 375 are one, to reduce um, pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and two, to provide enough housing. So it's really, really important, at least in my experience, that the silos, the people who care passionately about the economy or passionately about equity or passionately about the environment can come together in a housing solution that builds more in the right place with some emphasis on helping people who are less advantaged. Um, thank you. SCAG is going to have a housing summit on um, October 11, and we all look forward to the state's um, finally new housing strategy, Glenn. So thank you both. And thank you, Steve. Well, there you have it. Now we have all the problems and all the solutions in one. <clears throat> Connected is good. Um, we have time for a couple questions to be answered now and more questions to be answered later. We have a break coming up shortly. And after the next panel, you're going to have more questions and we have a big lunch.
Let's see, start right here. Question down here. Excellent presentations from everyone. I'd like, I actually have a request for Glenn and then a question for Leslie or Randall. So um, I live in Imperial County, which on this map is the one that is almost totally in red. And I'm just asking, can you please, please, please do something to change the label of disadvantaged communities? We have a hard enough time in attracting investment and feeling good about who we are and how we, how we live. If we could become a communities of promise or communities of opportunity, it would go a long way to removing a label that keeps us from recognizing our full potential. So if we could uh, work on that label. Uh, the other, this is a question for Leslie or Randall. Um, we track first time home buyer statistics, but is there an opportunity for us to know how many homes are being purchased by owner occupied folks versus being in purchased for investment? I'll, uh, the first question you're suggesting about changing the, uh, the title of disadvantaged communities, I think that your suggestion is it's an outstanding one. I don't know how long it's going to take to get those kind of title changes. It kind of reminds me of, um, you know, the slow progress that we made with, uh, you know, persons with disabilities. You know, first it was, you know, handicapped and, you know, that sort of thing. But um, I, think, I think you make a very good point. And I will do my best to uh, work on that. Um, in terms of the, you were asking what share of the homes were being purchased by investors. Um, there's survey data available. Um, the investor share was as high as 25 to 50 percent, depending on the area. When we came out, you know, the, I called the investors the canary in the coal mines because they were the ones in 08 and 09 that were buying up all the property. And in the stats, and I think they're from the state, you know, you 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 do have non-owner occupied, you know, so that's kind of one way at looking at, you know, it's owned by somebody, but someone else is living at it. And I defer to someone else that might be more familiar. Is there any other statistics? I mean, this is an example of something that's so frustrating about this industry in general is it's just very difficult to get hard data and people don't fill out a form that says, I'm a non-U.S. resident and I'm buying this piece of property or I'm going to be renting um, renting this out, but I do think you can look at the non-owner-occupied statistics. Randall, is there anything else you want to add? Sure, it's hard to get good numbers on this. The lenders often have stuff because people have to sign something when they get a house. Am I going to be living in the house or is it an investment? I think you'll see the numbers going down in the future for two reasons. The first is a lot of smart investors in, during the recession saw that houses were a bargain in California and they bought them. As house prices have come back to priest housing, to peak pricing, they're not the bargain they used to be and they, uh, it's much, much harder to make it work. And the secondly, on the new home industry, new home builders normally do not want to sell to investors because they're not as good for the neighborhood and it brings in competition three or five years down the road. In 2008, 9, 10, most of the home builders were eager to take investors because if you're on the verge of going broke or getting foreclosed out of a project, you take whatever you can get. Almost all the new builders now are trying to discourage investors. Hi, um, very interesting presentations, thank you. Um, since we're talking about millennials and housing, um, particularly affordable housing, you know, somebody from the audience brought up, uh, you know, how she was a quintessential 25 year old, but I'm, I'm 24, I'm turning 25 next month. I'm always thinking about sustainability, conserving water and, you know, um, also air pollution, like inside of homes, not just, you know, going outside, not just about greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. So I want to, you know, since we are talking about greenhouse gas reduction, uh, emission reductions, as well as affordable housing, uh, how about connecting the two and, you know, bringing up sustainable housing, sustainable, affordable housing, you know, simply put energy efficiency homes. Are we touching upon that subject or are we just talking about housing, luxury housing, affordable housing. How about just connecting the two? 
I'll start. A lot of it is connected now, and Stephen swore that it is connected. Almost by definition, the new kind of housing millennials are getting is typically smaller, it's typically closer in, and it's typically on a smaller home site. We've seen from the water agencies we deal with, the water usage on the new houses, they typically per household might use 40 or 50 percent less water. They're also using a lot less materials to build. And then California every couple of years changes the energy, energy standards. So I, I think you're going to see as the millennial housing continues to be built, more and more it will be sustainable, more and more it will help with the greenhouse gas challenge. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that too. Um, again, some, uh, those are important uh, aspects that you mentioned, which is essentially, you know, housing and sustainability. And so at the planning level, you know, that's you know, become much more of a mantra where we are trying to uh, work with Caltrans, um, transit agencies, in local governments, regional local governments, you know, to better plan housing and transportation. Uh, that's one aspect of it. And then going back to further sustainability and, and adding on to what Randall was saying, uh, the State Department of Housing, when we make, you know, um, when we use bond money for housing purposes and also the California Tax Allocation Credit Committee, TCAC, which uses uh, low-income housing tax credits, you know, for housing development purposes, there's new scoring criteria that gives, you know, additional points for, um, less water usage, you know, solar, um, you know, greater insulation. So again, all those factors as they start getting rolled up in the uh, California Department of Housing's, you know, building code, and it comes down to grants to produce that housing, it, it slowly gets out there because of the scoring points, um, you know, to finance projects that are more sustainable. Um, I'd like to put in another plug that it's not just cities versus suburbs, but the places where you can make the most impact for sustainability in terms of energy efficiency or simply non-car use are the downtowns in many of the cities here, many of the cities around the state that are used to be suburbs, but have walkable communities, have places where you don't need a car, have places where you can have the, the density and the building standards to have energy efficiency now. To get that, you're going to need to have new buildings that meet those standards. That's very unlikely to be large suburban single-family homes. That's a contradiction. Okay, so obviously we're thinking about connecting all these parts. I want you to go forth. We have a 10-minute break and have conversations and solve these questions, answer these questions. 